Welcome Dublin, San Ramon, San Francisco. I love you guys. Most of you, thank you. Uh, most of you are really nice. Yeah, no, I love you all. Love you all. Good, good to be with you. Um, if you're our guest, if you, this is your first time checking out Brave Church, we're so honored that you would be here, and uh, we hope that you leave here encouraged and you want to come back. Uh, my name is Darren Laws, I'm one of the pastors around here, and we've been studying through the Gospel of John together, and we're asking the question every week, who is Jesus? And we're going to be looking at John chapter 12, so you can go there if you'd like to on your Bible or your phone or on the screen, you can follow along. But the title of this teaching is Finding Real Community. And you know, real community is something that we all long for uh, and need to live full lives. It, it's a group of friends uh, who support us, that we do life together. But it's not always easy to find community. Have you noticed that? And you know, where you feel really safe and you feel supported. And uh, some of us listening today, you, you've tried and you've been burned, frankly. Or maybe you've opened yourself up to relationships and only to have, you know, to be be betrayed or to be let down in some way. You know, others of us were lonely. Let's just be honest. And uh, maybe you started out with uh, a new season of life and you're like trying to find your place. Uh, you might be new here to the Bay Area. You might be in a new uh, life stage. You know, all of a sudden you're, you're married, but none of your friends are married yet. And you know you need some married friends, but you don't no any married friends yet, or, or the same thing happens, you know, from no kids to kids, or from a full house to an empty nest, well, who's other people that are in my life phase and what I'm going through? Uh, you might even be looking for friends that you can relate to professionally, uh, people who understand your career, uh, they understand your unique challenges in the work that you do. The thing is, we all need friends. We need, we need friends so that we can feel understood, so that we're seen, and friends just make life better. They just do. But sometimes, even when we know that we need this, maybe even desperately need this, uh, relationships don't turn out the way that we had hoped that they would. Why is that? Why can relationships sometimes feel so hard to figure out? Why is such a basic human need sometimes so complex to have it met. Today we're going to be learning a lot about relationships, and I'm going to be sharing some things about friendship and life that will help you on Monday, that you'll be able to use on Monday morning. And first, let's read about some friends who, they're gathered in a home, uh, they're having Jesus over for dinner. Can you imagine that? Having Jesus over to your home for dinner. Would you DoorDash, or would you cook for Jesus, you know? I mean, these are thoughtful, provoking questions, all right? Uh, but let's pick up in John chapter 12, verse 1. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. He's just relaxing, chilling there, having a good time. And then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, and she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the whole house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why, uh, why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It, it was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she would save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Jesus, Mary, Martha, Lazarus, they are very close friends. I was waiting in line at Starbucks, and there was a young woman in front of me about age 30, and I just overheard their conversation, and she said, my boss just gave me a $200 bonus, and my boss said, take a friend out to dinner, like I have a friend. She said, hey, put all $200 loaded on my card. Coffee is my friend. People are hungry for friendship. Uh, God created us for friendship. And He designed us to do life together. And some people, you know, you're naturally strong in developing friendships, but not everyone is. 
Every day we encounter, you know, different types of people. Some are delightful, some are difficult. Some are inspiring, some are irritating. You know, some are firecrackers and some are duds. Still, I think we all would agree that we lack, when we lack meaningful community and friendships, life can be pretty flat. Which brings us to point number one. If you're taking notes, point number one is this. Jesus needed community, and so do we. Jesus needed community, and so do we. The authors of the popular book called What Retirees Want uh, say that we're entering into what they call the fourth era of retirement. And there's a lot to that. But did you know that the word retire, what it means? It means, it means to leave or withdraw or even disappear. <laughs> now, I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound like a really healthy options to me. Leave, withdraw, or disappear, right? One of the top 10 mistakes uh, they say that you can make when you're retiring is to leave your community of friends. Uh, many leave, they withdraw, or they disappear to another state. But the higher price they pay for a cheaper home ends in a higher price of paying up relationships. They become poor in relationships. They're rich in their home, but they're poor in their relationships. They've moved away. Every book written on how to live to 100, now some of us are reading those books, others could care less right now, but if you want to live to 100, it's been proven over and over again, two top secrets. You need to have, be a part of something, the higher mission that you're volunteering at church, that you have a cause, something very meaningful that you're involved in, and then secondly, you are active with a community of friends. And that's why brave groups, what we call brave groups, are so important. You know, too often we tend to prioritize our lives around things that matter very little, like houses and weather. You know, it's all about houses and it's all about the weather. How many people move away from the bay to buy a house and find themselves lonely and alone, but they've got their house? We can easily underestimate the value of our church family, the value of our pastors, the value of our community, the value of our friendships. We get excited about the great adventure, but we miss what is right in front of us. You know, during Jesus' three-year ministry, He had no place to call home. In a certain sense, Jesus was homeless. The Scriptures actually say the Son of Man had no place to lay His head. And yet there was one home that He returned to. There was one home that He retreated to. There was one home that He resorted to time and time again throughout His ministry, and it was a home that was owned by his dear friends, two sisters, Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus. And it was in this little town called Bethany. And Bethany is about, it's on the side of Mount Olives, and it's just about two miles outside of Jerusalem, a little country town. And Jesus enjoyed going there. Jesus enjoyed being there. He felt at home there. You know, some people, you go to their home and you just immediately feel at home. You know, uh, some homes you feel a little uneasy. You're not entirely sure uh, that you're welcome there. You know, there's still plastic on the couches or something. You know, it's just like you're not sure that this home has been lived in, you know. Others' homes, you just go there and you kick your shoes off and you're ready to relax and they offer you uh, chips and salsa and a cheese plate and, a, you know, iced tea. You know, that's my dream. And they're just prepared for your arrival. And, and the food is delicious. And, and then uh, other times you don't, you don't know exactly what you're eating when you go to someone's home for dinner. Um, our family was invited to some people's home for lunch, and they were so warm and friendly as we sat down to eat, and they were serving us cheeseburgers, and they seemed so excited about these cheeseburgers. And, and the dad goes, take a bite, pastor. And, I, and so I did. And you know how like in your mind, you know, I'm biting into a cheeseburger, so I'm very excited. And I know exactly what a cheeseburger tastes like. And so I bite into this expecting cheeseburger, <laughs> and I bite into it. And, and, and then all of a sudden, it was like, what the heaven is this? You know, it's like, what the heaven is this? I mean, this is like the worst cheeseburger I've ever eaten, and I'm thinking this, right? And then the father of the home smiles really big, and he goes, well, do you like it? And I'm like, oh my gosh, am I going to lie and then ask Jesus to forgive me later? I mean, what am I going to do? I didn't know what to say. And then he says to me, it's ostrich. And I go, and then he goes, we bought an ostrich farm, pastor. You bought what? Why? Why would you buy an ostrich farm, you know? And then he, he goes, guess what? 
listen to this. This is the first time we have ever cooked ostrich burgers. And we wanted you to be the first to experience it. And I'm thinking like, why would you do that to somebody? I mean, first of all, there's a reason that ostrich is not at Chipotle. You know, it's not one of the options when you're doing a burrito to go. You know, I only want to have some ostrich with that. I mean, there's a reason for that. And then secondly, why would you trick someone into eating something that you yourself have never tasted nor cooked? I'm thinking I'm going to die of some weird ostrich disease or virus or something. I mean, these are the kind of people that they show you their basement behind the staircase, and then they lock the door behind you and lock you in the basement. You know, it's like, this is scary, right? By the way, by the way, it turns out that they were genuinely very nice people. They were very honoring. It was a big adventure in their lives, and they really wanted us to be a part of it. Oh, well. But two things stand out to me in this passage of Scripture. First of all, they're having Jesus over for dinner. Secondly, Jesus knew that it was His last week on earth. He was days away. It was His last week. He knew that in a few days, He was going to go through the horrible pain of crucifixion. And these were the friends that He wanted to have a meal with. Imagine that. Number one, Jesus needed community, and so do we. Number two, or not, or not number two, let me ask you a question on this. I want to go back. When is the last time that you invited a friend to your home to honor them? When's the last time you've done that? I love that, that they invited Jesus over, and they wanted to honor Him. Do you have friends in your life that you might say, you know what, let's put together a dinner and just honor Him? Not a birthday, not an anniversary, just I just want to honor my friends. Another question you may want to ask is, if you knew that this was the last week of your life, who would you want to have a meal with? And why? Sometimes we underestimate and undervalue people in our lives, and we fail to create those special moments Is there a friend in your life beyond your spouse? I understand you can't live without your spouse, but is there another friend in your life? You go, man, I just just can't live without them. Have you told them that? Last week, I I took out a friend uh, for a birthday lunch, and I wrote a a birthday card to him. It's so hard to pick out a card. It takes forever to do that. And and then I decided that in this card, I'm going to tell my friend how much he means to me. Like, I'm going to put it all in this card. If this was our last meal together, like Jesus and his friends, what do I want to say to him? And so I read the card out loud to my friend, and then I gave him a box, a box of hard sourdough pretzels, because <laughs> those are his favorite. But I knew that, because I'm his friend. And you know what? I felt such joy in my heart after doing that. It felt so good to, to write it all out, to think it through. I was just blessed thinking about him as I wrote the words. And then to read it out loud was such a a moment. And then to give him the card. I've got to tell my friend how much he means to me over a meal. And I wanted to, to hear from I wanted him to hear from me how truly special he is. Don't die with your gifts still inside of you. Listen, if Jesus needed community, so do we. Number two. Not all relationships are created equal. Uh, There are basically four categories of relationship. A lot of people have written on them, spoken on them. There's a lot of different variations and different names for them. But uh, our brave SF campus pastor, Pastor Al, he recently recommended a book to me by Dr. Darius Daniels, and it's called Relational Intelligence. And in this book, the author gives his four categories of relationship, friends, associates, assignments, and advisors. Friends, associates, assignments, and advisors. Category number one, friends. Friends do not fit into the general, you know, category of I love all of humanity. Yes, we love the whole world, but friends have a very special place. They have a very special place of honor in our lives. In America, we tend to call everyone friends, and it's actually very unhealthy because not everyone has earned the privilege to be called your friend. 
And we call them friend until we hear that they do something and, you know, something stupid or bad or whatever. And then we kind of back away here in America and we go, well, yeah, I kind of knew them, but we weren't really close, right? Again, we use it too freely, the word friend. Friendships are much deeper relationships. So write this down. We owe everyone love. We do not owe everyone access to our life. We owe everyone love, but we do not owe everyone access to our life. Daniel says, it may feel wrong, maybe even unbiblical, to place people in categories. It may feel like we're assigning importance to one person over another person. He continues, yes, God has called us to love everybody, but I'm not talking about love. I'm talking about friendship. You know what Jesus said when speaking to highly dedicated followers of His? Here's what He said in John 15. He says, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my Father I have made known to you. Jesus defines his friends very specifically. He says, my friends are those who, who do my commandments. They follow my commands. That narrows the group. To be a friend of Jesus is someone who does what he commands. In other words, you, you actually share his values, his morals, and his world biblical view. And then Jesus says, my friends are someone I share intimate details with from my father. There's a special relationship going on here. Daniel puts it this way. Daniel says, friends are those whom God escorts into our environments because there's something they need to be for us in order to help us be what we need to be for Him. Friends offer more than company. They help us carry out our calling. Now here's an important question. Who is that kind of friend for you? Who are the people sent by God in your life that are helping you carry out your calling? And who are you helping to carry out their calling in life? Am I being a great friend? Am I helping encourage them into the calling that God's called them to? You know, friends like Mary and Martha and Lazarus, they were part of Jesus' calling. They were literally part of His journey to the cross. And Mary in this story was, she was so close to Jesus, she would sit at His feet and she listened to what He said. She knew something was coming up, and she saw into the future, and she anointed his feet for burial. Again, friends offer more than company. They help us carry out our calling. Those are the kinds of of friends that we want to cherish and that we want to honor in life. And some of us, we struggle our entire lives with relational intelligence. Can I be honest? For example, really just, just to highlight one common problem. Some people do not know when or how to stand up for a friend. We get confused on that. Some think like, well, they think they're honoring Jesus and being super loving when they refuse to take a stand against people who are trashing their friends. They think being like Switzerland in relationships is a noble thing. Did you know that biblical loyalty is committing to a person's well-being, and this includes speaking the truth in love. It means loving enough to search out the truth because you love your friend and you care about them. I'm, I'm at an age where I can say these things. Christian grace does not mean you cancel Christian values of loyalty and honesty in your relationships. There's way too much being political in relationships. And it's not healthy. And it's not Jesus. Standing by a friend who is right is a noble, Christ-honoring thing to do. You're being like Christ when you do that. Taking a stand for a friend is true true friendship. Choosing a righteous side is sometimes the most Christ-like thing you can do. Think about this. Read the Gospels. Jesus was clear on what He thought about lying religious people. People who were going to the synagogues and they were lying. He took a stand against them publicly. He called them out for hurting other people and the things that they were doing to other people. Jesus was never Switzerland on so-called religious people who lied and were divisive against other godly people. 
Now, this doesn't mean that you retaliate and attack the person who's attacked your friend. That's not at all what I'm saying. But it does mean you no longer associate with known religious people that are attacking your friends. The issue isn't hanging out with the ungodly. Jesus did that. He modeled that. Of course we're going to hang out with the ungodly. And guess what? We expect the ungodly to act like the ungodly. But the issue is hanging out with religious, so-called believers who are unjustly, falsely attacking other good Christian people, and you're just watching them do it online. You're watching them do it in your relationships, and you're still hanging out with them as if they've done nothing. I have a friend who lives in the Sacramento area, and, and a group of people recently went online, posted a letter, open public letter online, and just lied about it. And they made up a story that was not true. And they put all these things together, what so-called facts, and they, they misrepresented everything. And worse yet, they deceived other people into following them. I immediately called my friend and I stood with him and I stood against those who were spreading those lies. I didn't hang out with the Christian people that were lying about my friend. I didn't compartmentalize like some of us do. Well, their issues are only with him, not with me, so we're going to continue to hang out together. That's unhealthy. No, I stood by my friend's side and I sought the truth and I honored God in our friendship. We're talking about who Jesus is in this series, and if you want to know who Jesus is, Jesus stands for what's right. And some of the attributes of Jesus sometimes make us feel uncomfortable because Jesus rejected people who spread lies, who were malicious, who, sp who spoke hurtful words against believers. Jesus would take a stand publicly. He would call them names. If I started calling your friends names or people that you know that are lying or doing this or that, you'd think, well, that's not Jesus. No, actually that is Jesus. Read your Scripture. He called out their activity and deeds as wrong. Why? Because Jesus is loving. And He took a stand. There's this famous quote that says, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. I see that happening all across the land, and it's very unhealthy. In other words, you can have a great reputation until your friends don't stand up for you. Think about that. That's how powerful knowing who your real friends can be. And so we need to be loving people, but we also need Jesus' courage in our relationships. And too often, we just don't want to have conflict with those that are doing the wrong things. Jesus called out the hateful actions of other people. Don't hang out with believers who are spreading hateful things and call them friends. They know better. But do hang out with the ungodly people and love them to Jesus. Category number two. This is good, right? Yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> hey, they be, be brave, okay? <laughs> Category two, associates. This category is frequently confused with the category of friends. An associate is someone that you have a, a periodic or consistent association with. And they may become a category one friend uh, but someday, but, or they may never. They're typically like someone you work with regularly. You see them often, but you're not friends like outside of work. In fact, you, you may even spend more time with an associate at work than you do a category one friend. But don't be forced into making an associate a friend. Someone may share details of their lives with you, but that does not mean it's wise for you to as well. You see, we humans sometimes have a disease to please. And so we give some people way more access than is wise. Let me say that again. We humans sometimes have a disease to please. And so we give some people way more access than is wise. It takes time to figure out who the people are in your life and the role they play. That takes time. For example, uh, you would never call up an associate at work and say, hey, man, I'm homesick. Can you go by a CVS and pick me up my medication? No, an associate at work isn't going to do that. You, know, you don't call up an associate and go, oh, hey, I'm, I'm packing. Would you come and help me pack you know, my bedroom and you know, put my clothes away? Because I'm going to be, and then would you help me move? No, you would only call a friend for stuff like that, right? A close friend. Category three are assignments. An assignment is someone you're mentoring, you're coaching, or discipling. It's like 
Paul to Timothy or Moses to Joshua or Naomi to Ruth. Assignments are people that you invest your life in and God's assigned you to help them. But be careful. These are not the people that you go downstream to. They're not the people that you unload your whole life to. If you cross the lines between teacher and student, it often results in harm. When I was a younger leader, sometimes I, I didn't realize uh, how things work, and I would, I would unwisely just kind of share everything as a mentor and share my life and take them into confidence and so on and so forth, and, and uh, they would really ad- admire me as, as their mentor, but then I realized that they were going around sharing with other people. Yeah, I was hanging out with pastor, and he said this to me, and he said that, and, and it was not that I was saying anything inappropriate at all. It's just that they were using their proximity to me to make others feel like they weren't as close to me and that others were outside of the inner circle, but they were in my inner circle. And they were using that relationship. And to state the obvious, vulnerable moments between friends are meant to be respected as such. An assignment sees you as an asset to help them. You're helping them to succeed. Think of, the, think of it this way. NFL coaches do not hang out with their players. They're assigned to coach them. School teachers do not hang out with their students after hours. It's a warm, professional mentorship that's going on, but be clear in the lanes of that relationship and keep it healthy. Category number four is advisors. Another word for advisors is mentors, coaches. Uh, You might call them a spiritual father or a spiritual mother in the faith. By the way, if you do not have a spiritual mother or father in the faith, locally in your own community, it's likely because you've not created space for them here by honoring and recognizing those that are already near you. In every community, there are spiritual mothers and fathers in in Dublin and San Ramon and San Francisco. Are you willing to invite them into your life? You see, mentors do not force their way into your life. They're invited into your life. And so sometimes they're there for a limited time in your life. Sometimes they're in your life for your whole life. And so we have professional advisors uh, in career fields. We have spiritual advisors who pour wisdom and insight and direction into our lives. But it's important that we recognize the advisors that God has sent. That's how you get the most out of your advisors is you have to see them. You have to be humble enough to recognize who they are to receive from them but don't confuse them. They're not your hey buddy. <laughs> don't confuse them. They're not in all, of, uh, all these other categories. Not only do advisors impart exactly what we need at the right time in our development, but do you know they have the power and they have the influence to cause things to happen for us? Because they love us and they care about us and they want to help us? Mary and Martha and Lazarus saw Jesus as their spiritual advisor. But I think that they had something else. Somehow they were able to provide love and support and comfort and strength to Jesus when He needed it most. Their relationship went far deeper. They'd become like family together. By the way, before we move on, people with what I would call low relational intelligence do not seek out wise friends. They just don't. They're stuck in the comfort of their peer group. They do not seek out wise advisors and invite them into their life. They, they, they do not honor potential coaches or mentors. They don't want to acknowledge anybody uh, in their life that could have a special role. Sometimes it's because they've been hurt. Sometimes it's because they're wise in their own eyes, and they're not aware. They're blinded to how much they're in need in certain areas of their life. They'll use their uh, comfortable peer group for guidance as their sounding board which is so foolish because your friend hasn't lived any longer than you are and you're looking to them for guidance for your future, that's called low relational intelligence. And they they do this for any number of reasons. You may have a low relational intelligence because you have a low self-image and you think, well, they're too busy for me. I'm not going to reach out to them. Or you may withdraw from people who intimidate you. Sometimes the people that intimidate you, it's because you're aware something good's going on there and I'm intimidated by it. But you need to reach out. You need to break through that. And sometimes we, we, it's just because of pride that we don't ask, that we don't ask questions. Humility is found in question. When you ask questions, there's humility in that. 
We need all four categories in our lives. We need friends and associates and assignments and advisors. Point number one, Jesus needed community, and so do we. Point number two, not all relationships are created equal. And lastly, point number three, there are relational needs that only Jesus can fulfill. In this story, Mary worshiped Jesus at his feet. And she worshiped Jesus as Lord. There is, there's something we see in this divine exchange between Mary and Jesus that's very intimate and very special. Human relationships can never satisfy all of your needs. Your spouse cannot satisfy all of your needs. And the harder you grind on them to do that, the worse it's going to get in your relationship. Clinging on to certain kinds of relationships, trying to get everything you need out of certain kinds of people will not work for you. You need Jesus. You need Jesus. And Mary had this relationship where she saw Jesus was a friend. He was a teacher, advisor, a mentor, a coach, a rabbi. But more importantly, Lord of Lords. He has her, he has her everything. He had her whole heart. You see, all humans worship. Atheists worship. Agnostics worship. Religious people worship. Irreligious people worship. In the absence of of relationship with a loving Savior and a Heavenly Father, we turn from the Creator to the creation and we worship. What do I mean by that? We attach ourselves to other things to meet our physical, emotional, and spiritual and earthly needs. Material things. We atta- I need the material things to feel secure about myself. I need my career. We might even worship our own family. And that never goes well. You see, we choose lesser gods until we find real community and real love in a relationship with Jesus Christ. A category one friend is a gift from God, but friends cannot take the place of Jesus in your life. When you're alone and you're putting your head on your pillow at night, and it's just you and Jesus, it's just you and the monsters that you're dealing with in your own emotional and mental health, you need someone greater than a friend. You can find a great counselor, but a counselor can't heal you. You can find a great career, but a great career cannot love you. You can have a great family, but a family cannot meet your deepest thirst in your soul. Only Jesus, our Lord and Savior, can do that. Only Jesus is worthy of extravagant sacrifices like Mary made in that moment. Mary was so close to Jesus... She saw, she knew something was coming next. And she poured a year's worth of wages of perfume. And that day you would anoint people for burial. She gave a year's worth of anointing on him in that moment. She was so aware that that Jesus was about to leave her. And she didn't know what all that meant. All the riches of this world do not compare to knowing Jesus. There's nothing like knowing Jesus. Is there something inside of your heart that says, I would like to know Jesus? As we move towards Easter Sunday, I often begin to reflect and I ask myself, Darren, how well do you know Jesus? How well do you know him? How close are we, Jesus? Am I aware of what's coming? He wants to be close to you. But like spiritual advisors and others in your life, you have to be willing to invite Him in. The opening of the Gospel of John that we've been studying opens with Jesus Christ coming to earth, the Word becoming flesh and coming here. And then He comes to the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And they open the door and they invite Him in. And they welcome Him into their life. Jesus said in Revelation, He said, Here I am. I stand at the door and I knock. I'm knocking right now. And if anyone hears my voice and you open the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Jesus is offering you His life. 
It was the last week of Jesus' life and he wanted to be with his friends because only there could he find real community. And only in this context of the body of Christ, fellow believers, bonded together in one truth that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, can we find relationships and real community? Many people miss moments. While Mary grasped this moment, this opportunity, she anoints Jesus' feet for the burial. Judas, he missed the whole moment. His heart was so far from God, he's just worried about money. Are you worried about money? The 12 disciples, Jesus told them over and over again, I'm going to Jerusalem and I'm going to give my life. That's why I believe that Jesus, Mary knew. She listened. She was at the feet of Jesus. She knew what was coming. Are we listening? We can miss really big moments and not tune in to our greatest need. The Scriptures teach that God has placed eternity in our hearts. You know what that means? Every single human being, whether you believe in God or not, you're aware that there's something more. You know, deep in your soul, there's something more after this life. It means that we intuitively are aware that there's more awaiting us after death, and this life is not all that there is. The Apostle Paul said, if you hope in this life alone, you're a miserable person. Well, why? Well, look around you. Watch the news. All your hope can't be in this world. Don't miss this moment to receive Jesus into your heart, to open the door, to invite Him into your life. Would you bow your heads with me if you wouldn't mind and just close your eyes, just, just creating a sacred place between you and the Lord. Is this your moment? Is there something inside of your heart that says, yes, I would like to invite Jesus into my heart. I'm not going to have you stand or come up. This is between you and him an intimate moment of relationship. Would you like to do that? Just slip up your hand and say, yes, Pastor, that's what I want to do right now. I want to do that in this moment. Just respond to him. Go ahead. And I want to pray with you. And I want to pray for us and our relationships and our friendships in this place. Lord Jesus Christ, you see the response of hands. You see the response of people's hearts in this moment. Lord, I, we ask you to forgive us of all of our sins. Lord Jesus, we need you. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. We invite you into our hearts and into our home and into our lives. Lord, I pray for us in our community of the Brave Church family. I pray for healthy relationships godly men and women that would stand by each other, love each other, stand for friendship, stand for loyalty, stand for truth, that we would be brave enough to speak the truth in love and to care for one another, to make space for one another and time for one another and to honor one another. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. God bless you.